coming up on this episode of The Roundtable. The terror and, you know, apoplexy with which the audacity of, like, CNN hosting Trump at a town hall, it's like, just the, the whole point is just like, you, you can't look at it because anytime you look at him, anytime you're allowed to sort of hear what he actually says, their whole sort of narrative. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there is that phenomenon, Ryan, the sort of like exploding cigar phenomenon of yeah. everything they try to do, everything they love. You know, every time they get there, wish their grubby little wish to like arrest him or put him in handcuffs or whatever, it always reflects worse on them than on him yeah no matter what like no matter how badly you think about him even if you're not a trump fan inevitably his enemies like look worse you know the, the, if, if you if you hated <sighs> trump in extremis it would still be the case that his enemies would be the only people that looked worse than him to you like if you really look at this thing head on Hello, and welcome once again to The Roundtable, your weekly publishers and editors podcast here at The American Mind. I'm your host, Spencer Clavin, features editor of The American Mind and associate editor of the Claremont Review of Books. I am joined by managing editor Seth Barron, as well as publisher and president Ryan Williams. And we have a special guest. It's always uh, exciting when that happens, and it's a particular pleasure to welcome Hadley Arcus onto the show. Professor Arcus is the Edward Ney Professor of Jurisprudence Emeritus at Amherst College. Many of our listeners will probably already know him or be familiar with his work, but just to quickly summarize some of his many achievements, Arcus was the main advocate and architect of the bill that became the Born Alive Infants Protection Act, which will become relevant to our discussion here in just a moment. And he's the founder and director of the James Wilson Institute on Natural Rights and the American Founding in Washington, D.C. He's also the author of numerous books, the latest of which is entitled Mere Natural Law, Originalism and the Anchoring Truths of the Constitution. We're going to get into some of that with him in a bit here in just a moment. Professor Arcus, welcome to the roundtable. Thank you for joining us. It's good to see you all. It's nice to see eyes on you for the first time. That's right. Finally, we meet face to face, having uh, having shared emails and all sorts of other things. In this right. digital world, we have to, you know, gradually reveal the various parts of our presence. But we uh, we wanted to begin, uh, Hadley, just by asking you to tell us a little bit about this book, and maybe we can start with the title. What what's meant by mere natural law, and, trying, and why this was, book now? Yeah, I was trying to draw on that sensibility of of C.S. Lewis in. in mere Christianity, when he started initially drawing upon the conversation of children, mm. you see, in that conversation, you have people, kids not really speaking about likes and dislikes, but matters of arguing about matters of right and wrong. And the argument makes no sense unless they're presupposing the existence of standards of judgment to tell the difference between right and wrong answers. And this goes, and if I use examples of things, of things that, that, that youngsters understand that seem to evaded the understanding of Justice Holmes, for example. But the point was appealing to those precepts of common sense that precede all things, those precepts of common sense that the ordinary man not only readily knows, but has to take for granted in getting on with the business of life. Now, the American founders, the Constitution was not the source of their moral understanding. Those principles were there before the Constitution, and the founders appreciated they would be there even if there were no constitution. Mm. Just the way that John Quincy Adams say that that right to petition the government is implicit in the idea of a free society. It would be there even if it had been mentioned in the First Amendment. It would be there even if there were no First Amendment. It would be there even if there were no constitution. And Marshall mm. also made arguments of that kind about those things that were so fundamental, they'd be there even if there were no constitution. So we're trying to risk to bring back that understanding, show people that the most critical principles here are accessible to ordinary people, and somehow lawyers have absorbed theories. It's like that line of Jefferson where he says, 
You can give the same moral problem to a professor and the plowman. And the plowman is apt to get it right because he won't be distracted by artificial theory, rules, call it theories. So how the question is, how is it that lawyers schooled in the theories of statutory construction put forth a judgment that any ordinary man could see as imbecilic? Hmm. So that's that's the kind of tension I'm, I'm kind of going to uh, in the book, that they make that those precepts of common sense often give us a better guide into the to the principles that form the main strands running through our law and bring it back. Sometimes they, they're so fundamental that people are unaware of them. And it's a matter of, it's also Plato's Mino. Mm -hmm. You feed questions to that, that slave boy, and he's, and he's sort of working out the principles of geometry. So we say, it's already locked in you. Mm -hmm. We give people the questions. And when they come out with the answers, they have the sense with these principles of natural law that yeah, they've known them all the time. They've known them all their lives. Hence, it puts me in now. mind of uh, Dr. Johnson's response to Barclay, Barclay who had argued. I, I refute you thus. Right, right, right. That he, I, I, I refute this, this immaterialist philosophy by kicking a stone, right? That there's something kind of just obvious and evident directly to the senses of your average Joe. And well, people it, have been talked out of this in some way, haven't they? You know, to, yeah. to feel like they can't rely on that intuition. That's right. That's right. Uh, mm. Reed had something about this ancient um, oh, character who, who also denied the existence of the material world, but that didn't, didn't prevent him from chasing the cook a mile down the road for overdoing the roast. <laughs> well, exactly. Exactly. So there is this, uh, there's this really appealing, I think, Forced to this argument that if you end up in a place that contradicts, violates all common sense, then it's not common sense that has to go. It's your theory that has your precious theory that has to go. And um, so this brings me actually to specifically one of the chapters I wanted to make sure we talk about. And that's the, right. the final chapter, chapter right. 11, to do with Dobbs and the uh, and life after Roe. It's something we've talked about in this podcast, something we've dealt with, you know, on the site uh, on American Mind as well. Um, this is a, a chapter called After the Overruling of Roe, the Natural Law Moment. And given everything that we've just said about sort of obvious basic truths that even precede the Constitution, most fundamental of which, one of the most fundamental of which is surely the right to life of human individuals, that that's not something that we that exists because it's written in the Constitution. It's something that the Constitution acknowledges. Um, Tell us a little bit about this chapter, where you see the natural law movement going in the wake of the Dobbs decision and that, uh, well, and that victory. An interview today was giving me credit. Like the, the top 10 pro-life leaders are giving me credit for Dobbs. And I'm mm. just deeply, deeply disappointed in Dobbs. It really, yes, it did reflect all the premises of originalism, which is to say, once again, a concentration of the Constitution utterly detached from its, its anchoring moral ground. Mm. Ryan will remember our dear Michael Ullman. And Michael Ullman and I were writing and working the pro-life cause before Roe versus Wade. And the concern at the time, I think it was bringing people into the streets, was a concern for babies being dismembered from poison. That is not the way the issue was seen by the six conservative judges who wrote in this case. Mm -hmm. Their argument was that abortion is not contained in the text of the Constitution. Therefore, there is nothing that a federal judge can say in proclaiming a right to abortion emanating from the Constitution. Our work is done. We simply say it's not there. But at the same time, they, they the true style of, of, of conservative jurisprudence, they steer around the moral substance of the matter. So they say nothing about the human standing of the child or the rightness or wrongness of abortion. Hmm. So that even with Justice Alito, the child in the womb is never considered anything more than a potential human being. Well, it may be a potential outfield, but it's never been a potential human being. So they leave an unsubstantiated, the human standing of the child in the womb. Well, what difference is it? If they had affirmed that point, they would have sent the matter back to the states with this understanding. We're dealing with the taking of a small human life. And so we give it to you to figure out how the taking of this life will be reconciled with your other laws of homicide because the laws of homicide have ever been indifferent to the size and age weight of the, of the victim. The killing of an older man is not a graver homicide than the killing of a 
of a child. So we give that to the state of Turner over to the states. But what it would do for the federal government, though, is to say, we planted the borders. The Congress can now act under the 14th Amendment when the protections of law are being withdrawn from a whole class of human beings. Everybody withdrawn from the South in the 50s and 60s. And the judges had to work through the coils of federalism as to whether the Congress could reach directly to these points. But look, the key point here, I think, was confirmed when Brett Kavanaugh, in a concurring opinion, said, oh, it's so interesting. He, he was channeling Douglas in the Lincoln-Douglas debates. The Constitution is neutral. It's utterly indifferent on the matter of taking innocent life. The principle of the Constitution tells nothing about the matter of, of taking, of licensing a regime of taking innocent life. But Alito put in the, the ground that would lead to a further argument. He tried to show that Mm. There's no principal ground on which to deny the human standard of the child. And he didn't extract the conclusion that he couldn't have done that without losing his fifth vote. Right. And, right. So uh, that it but it's it that's there to be it's there to be drawn upon in the future. Right. If local judges start drawing out the implications, send it back up, uh that he's the only one I think who has the nerve uh, actually to do it. It's extremely interesting. And in fact, perhaps some of your most pointed criticism is aimed precisely at conservatives who kind of fall for the siren song of backing away from these moral questions that if they, you know, they don't want to touch them or, or maybe as you're suggesting here, they sometimes they can't touch them in order to get the decisions that they that they want or that they yeah. need. And so it, it, is it your view that because that the implications are are there, even though they're not spelled out? Do you have, are, are you hopeful about the, a, a future that moves further in this direction that, that judges might sort of draw these implications out more, or, or do you think it's, it's unlikely that they'll do that? Well, Sam Alito hands it off to the political class. So we know the political mm -hmm. class, that they've always been befuddled, mm -hmm. not, very uncomfortable about talking of an issue that leaves their constituents uncomfortable. They, they've, so Don McCann just said, right, he said, he put it aptly and he said, the provision on overturning Roe has been in the Republican platform for 40 years. Wouldn't you think the Republicans had figured, figured out some way of talking about it? Mm -hmm. So first you hand it off to the political class, they're not going to come through. But you've given something, you might on the young conservative judges in, in the courts. Mm -hmm. But given what we know of the conservative judges, they've been, they're cautious, they're cautious. If you may have a test of this case in the, the Marvel, uh, case on Mifeprosto that Matt Kaczmarek put the hold on this thing. And it's interesting, as our friends at the Wall Street Journal say, well, you know, there's a test. We have to, they found, FDA found, made a test on how safe it was for the person who takes it. They didn't say how safe it was for the victim. That entity has been ruled out of the problem. My hunch is that 24 years now, I'm afraid, we're going to see abortion carried out in massive numbers mm. in California, in Illinois, New York. That's not the end to which Mike Hume and I were working. Mm. But the conservatives will say, well, that's all we ever promised to do. And say, yes, Roe versus Wade, we brought down that. It was a, it was a famous victory. Mm. It was supposed to do something else, but we no longer seem to remember what it was. And after all, look, jurisprudence can't do everything, can it? Interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, I, before we let you go, I wanted to invite you to do a little bit of um, shorter term predicting. Because as, you, as, as, as our listeners will know, we've got a fair number of court decisions coming down the pike not too long from now. We haven't talked too much about them on the show because we've been waiting to talk with you. Yeah. I am curious to know which of these cases that are coming down, I mean, some of them are very high profile, students for fair admissions versus president fellows of Harvard College, this affirmative action case. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what you're watching most most closely and, and what you... I, like, I, I tried, I was going over the, the transcript of the oral argument in the case of racial preferences and it's hard to see what kind of an argument the conservative judges are putting into place. The mm. court never did get clear on what the principal ground was of racial discrimination. 
They never said it was, you know, the old question was, if we separate the kids on the base of race and the reading scores go up, does it cease to be wrong? Or is the wrong does, is it wrong in principle, regardless of what it does to the reading race and everything else? The court never did get clear on what the principle was. We think it has something to do with back into the assumption that if you know somebody's black, you know race essentially determines their moral conduct. If you know their, their race, you can draw interesting inferences about them. But that backs to the assumption that you know, we're all members of race. If we're saying that, that our conduct is determined by forces outside our control, none of us are responsible for his own acts. Now, by that construction, it's always inadmissible to draw adverse moral inferences about people in the base of race, but the court has never come to that judgment. It came close in the Baki case. The way this is going to end, probably, with, is with John Roberts writing an opinion to knock it down, and then he's going to invoke Carlos, the great Carlos Bay's, or rather, his, his um, plagiarism of Carlos Bay's line to say, to end racial discrimination, you end racial discrimination. But the problem is that some of the judges there, and I say, I say, well, could we achieve the same result, getting the right racial balance hmm. by using non-racial criteria? But they're assuming there's something called a right racial balance. Hmm. If they understood that there's something categorically wrong with this, there would be no right racial balance. So you take a look at this, and, and the, the conservative judges really don't seem to be clear on the deep argument that they want to make here. They may, they may get to that line, and you'll probably find Clarence Thomas and, and Sam Alito saying something about this should never be admissible. Mm. But we may find others saying, well, let me, it's this, we, we, tried non, we tried non-racial tests. They never gave us the result. They say they can't give us the result. We don't know what the number is. It simply says you got to have more. you got to have more minorities. Uh, this is what Brett Kavanaugh or Amy Coney Barrett would say. We've asked them. What is enough? What is the number? We can't tell you. We can't tell you. All we know is there's got to be. If we tell, if he gave you a number, it's a quota. Right. We can't give you. Mm. All I can tell you is, well, it's there's got to be more. Mm. So one way or another, I think they're going to limp their way, whether John Roberts writes it himself or gives it over to Clarence Thomas, maybe to put it into it. My hunch is it's it's going to be the same culminating line. Either John will use it in his major opinion or a concurring opinion to wait to end racial discrimination is finally to stop discriminating in the race. Mm. So it's kind of come out like that. The, the 303 case I found really quite interesting. And I'm dubious of make, about making these claims of religious exemptions. It, first of all, as John Courtney Murray would say, it, it, it engages in a libel of religion. It reduces religion simply to matters of belief that have no claim to validity or, or, or command the assent of people who don't share those beliefs. And you have some strange things like Mr. Green and Hobby Lobby saying, I earnestly believe that life begins at conception. Earnestly believe? It's an, it's an inescapable truth established in the books of embryology. First, you get, you get the religious to convert a moral argument into something non-moral and a belief. Then you ask them simply take an exemption from the laws that are wrongful laws that are being imposed on everybody else. But in this case, I think you can appeal to, you know, Justice Sutherland's old appeal in the um, old AP case. Hmm. You could, and you could, you could translate this. If I have a pro-choice jury, let's say it's legitimate for people to form an association to promote abortion. It's legitimate for them to associate with people who share that view and to have a pro-choice journal. Let's say one of the editors converts into a pro-life. Well, it should be open to these and says, I'm she's being fired, I'm being fired for my political beliefs. I say, no, no. If there is a right for us to advance, share these these causes and advance these interests, we have a claim to preserve the integrity of what we're doing. No, you may not be working here, but you can make, you can find employment with pro-life organizations. There, it's not as though the the law is coming down forbidding you from speaking. It's your free to move. I think the best course for this is to avoid the matter of religious uh, religious belief and religious mm -hmm. exemption, and take on the substance of the thing, 
and say, well, it's legitimate. If it's legitimate for you to keep a, a gay rights group which can refuse to hire and endorse anyone who is critical of the, of the homosexual life, it must be legitimate. Is it still legitimate in this country for people to be in opposition to same sex? Well, if it is, it must be legitimate for me to preserve an association or a business that doesn't accept. And I, I sort of favor that as, as the argument I, I would pursue. In so many of these cases, you know, the, the Jack Phillips case was, um, it was found on drawing adverse interest, uh, adverse co- inferences based on sexual orientation. You refuse to make the case. They didn't have same sex marriage installed then. They said it was simply a matter of, um, of engaging of discrimination against somebody based on sexual orientation. Now you look, even the gay rights groups will admit, will find some sexual orientations is illegitimate. They're not clear they want the man boy association of pedophilics marching with them. They're certainly not in favor of bestiality. If the gay rights organizations see some sexual orientations as illegitimate, how can we be warranted in having a statute that is sweeping away bans all discriminations based on sexual orientation? And as my friend Paul McHugh pointed out at Johns Hopkins, we've done these studies of people like like the study of, of non heterosexual women who in the space of about 10 years changed their orienta- sexual orientations two or three times. It's unstable. So well, if there's a, an argument here about sexual discrimination based on of sexual orientation, we're not clear who the, the litigating party is. It's, mm-hmm. Do we have a stable litigating party? So my, see, my preface is not to skirt around these things, but to challenge the very substance of the law. As mm-hmm. you know, when... when Bishop Laurie resisted Obamacare. So the, the, the Catholic argument on abortion has never been an appeal to faith. It's been an appeal to the moral reasoning of the natural law. As, as Aquinas said, the divine law we know through revelation. The natural law we know that reasoning accessible to human beings is human beings. You don't have to be Catholic to understand the uh, Catholic position on abortion because it's a, simply a, an argument woven through with embryology and principle of reasoning. Well, if that's the case, you know, as Bishop Lawyer would say, we're not seeking an exemption for the church. We're saying this is a wrongful law. It should be imposed on no one. And I think that's the path we could take in, in these cases. Or you say, Mr. Br- see, what people don't see, see is our religious tradition, I think, enters our life in more than a, a claim for an exemption for laws imposed on others. It enters most critically by establishing that biped who conjugates verbs is a moral agent, or as Lincoln would say, no, nothing made in the graven image was sent into this world to be uprooted. Okay, now if you understand that, you see that that's a, that establishes the human being as a bearer of rights. Like what? His right not to have his property taken. His right not to have his property confiscated by forcing him to pay for abortions to his own private company, whereas he's already connected to the uh, promotion of abortion through the nexus of the tax system. This is something, what I'm pointing out is there are different kinds of arguments, and it's not, it's not a uh, less dignified argument to say what our religious attrib- tradition establishes, that these are rights-bearing beings. None of their liberties are trivial because they themselves are not trivial. And, they, and so it's just as bad to, to, to deal with Mr. Green by confiscating his property, directing it to ends that he would not favor. So there are other ways of treating these issues, I think, without mm-hmm. falling back on that claim, libeling religion by reducing it all to matters of belief, which need not be taken seriously by people who refuse to share them. I think that's a great illustration of the way this sort of reasoning can play out and how it sort of helps us to frame or recenter i suppose the the debates that kind of come into play in these spaces. spencer i wanted to circle back just one last question for hadley if you were yeah. were you going to wrap up i was but go ahead yeah yeah hadley i wonder if you um you know were confronted with this um with this problem of public opinion on abortion uh maybe exemplified in the results of the midterms in some states that uh you know half the country is in some ways uh and under 
certain restricted circumstances, fairly pro-choice. So what would your Lincolnian advice be to the pro-life movement on how to proceed going forward? Well, the first thing is the libel is put on them. And, you know, actually, this there could have been a, a, a rescue here, John Roberts's approach. So like, Brian White years ago shocked his colleagues by saying, look, I can accept the right to abortion if it's put on the same plane as the other things. In other words, he thought, you, yeah, you don't tell me the right to an abortion when the human's, the woman's life is in danger. We could all agree on that. Right. The dissenters in Rose, they do agree on that now. If you simply say all the steps, yes, there is a custody right to abortion that involves everyone accepts on both sides where the life of the woman is in danger. Now we're putting the rest of it open to our reasoning and deliberation of the states. The problem with the pro-life is that they've been tagged falsely as wanting to uh, ban all abortions. I mean, there may be a case for it. It's not prudent to do that. But you find even people who are pro-choice do not th think that abortion may be restrained under many circumstances. The point is to just get the main points in place and then just ping people. I think, you know, my, my vote was to start with, can we protect the child born alive who survived the abortion? Can you admit to us this is a real human being who claims the protection of the law? And then let's kind of go, let's go back. What's the difference in that same child five minutes earlier, five weeks, five months? Right. You make any of these starts, 15 weeks, okay. okay. And the Wall Street Journal is complaining that DeSantis wants to take it to six weeks. Well, the, the Sam Alito's point was when he said, if we can protect a child at the point of viability, why can't we respect its life before? It's the same entity. So our friends at the Wall Street Journal say, well, how can DeSantis go from 15 weeks to six weeks? Well, it may not be politic it may be politically hard to sell in other places, but he's not saying it. He said, we've reasoned through it here. We don't think that the move from 15 weeks to six weeks makes a difference because it's the same entity after all. It's the same entity. We've reasoned through it this way. And uh, we just leave it out to other people to reason it the same way. Maybe they'll come to our conclusion. At the federal government right now, as a result of Dobbs, you actually have Republican politicians now talking to themselves in the The issue remains wholly in the states. So they're actually promising not to use those federal levers to try to preserve life in the, in the, in the blue states. It, it may be harder now than it was three years ago to pass our Born Alive Infants Protection Act. Yep. Because of Dobbs, you may find five or six Republicans saying, we're not sure we, that we should use the powers of the federal government. The, the Dobbs Act has created, put more burdens on the pro-life movements, withheld the creed premises that we need to advance the cause in the states as well as the federal government. And it's created a political landscape lopsided. It's put, it's, it, it, Look, Roe did not really establish a right to abortion. It changed the culture. It converted abortion from being something aboard, discouraged, forbidden, to something approved, celebrated, promoted. Mm -hmm. The decision in Dobbs did nothing to touch that moral ground and the moral understanding. So it's harder. It's so something about the, the the argument has to be put out. Look, everybody on both sides accepts there is a right to abortion on the human side of that. Women's life things. We'll all agree on that. So now we're going to talk about how far along we can protect, recognize the human standing of the child and protect it. And look, the, 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 the surveys show most people in the country would favor protecting a child as soon as the heartbeat can be heard. Right. Of course, that doesn't, doesn't mean the beginning of life. The heartbeat is simply something else coming online now for a human life already in being, powering it, integrating its own growth. But these are signs that people sort of will, will respond to. The, the support is out there. But first, so far, it's, it's a matter of the media and the political class, just a shower of misrepresentation of what the ends of the pro-life community are. And it's going to be hard to deal with that, you know. The other side says abortion is not infanticide, which means they're willing to protect the child at some point. So why don't we simply invite them to tell us when? We could begin there, begin the conversation. Yeah. If nothing else is coming out, let's say, let's offer this. Can we at least protect the child? Let the child is born alive when it's not encumbering the interest. Can we at least begin there? We needed somebody in political authority to avoid the panic 
bring something moderate forward for us to concentrate on. Mm -hmm. This is what takes political leadership. Yeah. This is George W. This is what we need now. And I don't know who's in a position to do it. Perhaps Ron DeSantis, because he has this stuff, to say, look, uh, let's get clear on what we're doing. Pro life movement wants to protect life, yes. No one's quibbling with the right to protect a little bit with a child born alive. Uh, no one's with a life, with the, when the woman's life is endangered. We have questions of rape. Yes, we understand that. As a matter of prudence, we may have to go along with it, but you understand that our position is predicated on the innocence of the child. That innocence doesn't disappear in a rape. We're willing to go along with you. You know, the way that Lincoln had it was compelled to support the laws on miscegenation because there's such a powerful passion. Right. So we, may, we may have to go along, but please understand, it's a really prudential for us. We, there's no way we can endorse this as a principle. Please understand that. And we can work through these things in, in other ways. But if, if once you plant it, uh, and I think, for example, the Born Alive Act should be brought into, into blue states. It may be one way of cracking the adamantine opinion over there. I don't know how I don't know how our people ever talked, even the Wall Street Journal talked themselves into the notion that people are going to be content to fight this out within the confines of the states. Mm -hmm. You know, you remember at the Constitutional Convention, that colloquy between Roger Sherman and, and James Madison. Sherman says, Look, we've done all our work, everything we have to do. We strengthen the powers of the national government in foreign affairs defense. And man says, no, no, no. It was the insecurity of private rights within the states that did as much to bring forth this canceling debts in Massachusetts. So we get the uh, the contracts clause. Mm -hmm. Then with the 14th Amendment, we enlarge the powers of the federal government to, in, to go in to protect black people, newly freed slaves in the South, and vindicate those rights. It's all there. It was there from the very beginning. And so we find as a typical matter that a local government Bars a topless bar. And of course, the, what the owners do is go into a federal court to try to annex to their side a, 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 a body of law with more, that's more libertarian in character. I mean, this has been baked in for years. Mm -hmm. Why do the deep geniuses in the press, like the Wall Street Journal, assume that a woman is being stripped of something she regards as fundamental, right? She's going to fight this out simply in the States. Why would she not make an appeal to the federal government? to a Democratic Party, which is quite content to come down on her side. I just never understood how our people actually thought they could teach that this matter belongs only in the states, and it would stay there. Right. The whole logic of our government points in an entirely different direction. Hmm. Yeah, it's certainly a, uh, it, it will be a remarkable view. I mean, I think that the time scale in which people tend to think about this issue is, is sort of compacted. Uh, Dobbs being so new I, I i think we're going to see a, a, a lot of kind of re maneuvering around this but i agree with you about the disinformation i mean that's the, the sort of fundamental thing about so much of the public oh you, know, you have a press that leads to, to, to lie and figure it's going to take some time for anybody catches up and something people look at the reception of the durham report my god none of these people going to the people who've lied about it and saying well look at barack obama in the press the past time they could have come to the president and said what did you know? When did you know? Is it really true that you were informed that this matter was a hoax? Hmm. It, it said nothing about it. Why can't he be asked that question? Right. Why can't all these people sign on be confronted with, this is what you said, and this is what they say about what, what you've said in the Dharma report? Do you deny it? Hmm. And if so, how do you explain it? No one is no one in the media, apart from Fox, will be raising those questions. And of course, our friends at Fox never want to talk about abortion. No. That's, You'll never see in, you know, the, this, the Born Alive Act was around 15, 2016, when during the, the debates over the Republican Party, where uh, Brett Baer never raised the question about the Born Alive Act, how you'd stand on that. It's one, it was the clearest points of dividing the parties, maybe bringing the Republicans together, but he never raised that question. Why? Something is at work in Fox where they're not really inclined to really want to avoid a question that many of their viewers find uncomfortable. So the best place now is Fox, but don't don't so don't uh, fool yourself. 
that Fox is not itself appearing to become a bit of a burden in dealing with this, this issue of abortion in our, in our national politics. Well, Professor Hadley Arcus, we have to let you, we have to bid you farewell, but I'm just going to tell people, <laughs> alas, not, not forever, just for now. Okay. Um, okay. And I'm, I'm going to encourage people one more time to head to Amazon, head to Barnes and Nobles, wherever you pick up books and purchase a copy of Mere Natural Law, Originalism and the Anchoring Truths of the Constitution. It's been a, a total pleasure. Thank you very much for, for coming on. Good to we'll, see you, Hadley. Well, in the time that remains. We just wanted to hit a couple other topics from the news. First and foremost, actually, Hadley mentioned it as we were talking, this Durham report, 306 pages basically putting paid to the Russia collusion narrative about Donald Trump. If you needed this, if you wanted this, it seems many of us apparently did need it, although probably not the people listening to my voice or the people on this podcast, but it's still pretty remarkable and it's being, you know, off, uh, predictably downplayed, but, but makes it, you know, a big difference. You know, the special counsel John Durham uh, puts out this, this final report, basically just saying there was no basis for the FBI's investigation, lacked any actual evidence of collusion before they let them to the probe, that the, the pretext for it all was thin, that there was partisan hostility and even like Clinton oppo research, very obviously involved. There was a double standard at play when it came to, you know, relationships between negative information about Trump versus negative information about Hillary. Essentially that this was a psyop from the beginning. I, I, I don't really think I'm exaggerating. You guys can tell me if you think I'm overstating the case here, but this is pretty scathing. And I wonder if you think it will make any difference or if this is just another <laughs> one of these, like, you know, we've all already sort of made our decision about this. Well, the way it's being presented universally, as far as I can tell, across like the mainstream media, is that it was a huge uh, refutation of Trump's narrative, of Trump's defense of himself, of the entire right, you know, right wing, you know, just to put it bluntly, narrative, because... Durham didn't indict James Comey or you know McCabe or any of the any of the actors. So because there were no criminal indictments, therefore it proves that I mean essentially the way they're playing it is that this proves that Trump actually did uh collude with Russia. <laughs> <laughs> like that's 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 kind of that's that's the impression you get just reading the headlines. This is like this um, makes me think we but, live in this Rorschach world where like everything is sort of already like it, the, the content of any news story is whatever fits into yeah. your creed. Scott Scott Adams's heuristic from 2016 that we're watching two different movies holds up remarkably well, I think, in our current politics. I mean, if you read the executive summary. It's clear that the FBI used the Steele report, GPS fusion, all of that as you know a groundless reason to 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 to, to start this completely politicized investigation and to spread calumny and lies. So, I mean, I've I've only read the executive summary. I mean, I haven't dedicated the hours it would take to go through the whole thing much less all of its, you know, um, all of the footnotes and so forth. But, I mean, it's damning. It's yeah. utterly damning. Right. And it proves that we live in like a Stasi state. Yeah, the irony, the great irony of it is that the whole operation is something that would make a Soviet intel intelligence operative proud. The whole thing. As for it making a difference, Spencer, no, I don't think it'll make any difference. Alas, the one silver lining, I suppose, or the one way in, in which it can make a bit of a difference is, is it... It's a thorough and authoritative from a fairly unimpeachable source, although they're already trying to impeach Durham as just, you know, Barr's lackey. Uh, that just puts all the facts before us and confirms what many of us thought to be true, but didn't quite have this sort of evidence all in one place for. So that helps a little bit in the, uh, it, it helps with, you know, I think independent voters or your, your sort of not that politically minded neighbor you know, it helps convince them that Trump really was treated badly in a 
in what should be the biggest um, political scandal in U.S. history, at least in post-war U.S. history by far. Mm. That is, you know, the the concerted and um, collusive effort of our domestic and foreign intelligence apparatuses with the candidate of one party to basically undermine the legitimacy of a, of the candidate of the other party who ended up winning the election. It's really remarkable. In a serious country, a lot of people would be going to jail for this. Alas, we're not a very serious country anymore. Hmm. Well, right. I mean, I'm sure it would be very rewarding to wade through those 306 pages. That there's a lot of kind of good stuff in there. But I, Seth, I'm with you. Like, I don't, I don't need to be <laughs> convinced. And that is a good point. The sort of like the you're not crazy value of it all. A, a lot of the times, these affronts and abuses of power are kind of so enormous and they're so brazen that it's hard to kind of marshal all of the facts and evidence to like identify them they're sort of everywhere so you can't really point to them so this is a useful document in that respect for sure that thing ryan that you said about you know after all the accusations that trump was sort of a russian operative these very you know apparatchiks are a perfect kind of illustration of what actual Soviet tactics look like. That is in itself kind of a classic, you know, inconsistency or that's a, that's a classic paradox of, you know, Stasi, Sto Soviet style rhetoric is like, yeah. you accuse your opponent of being somehow but, a foreign asset. Well, yeah, the, the other way this actually, now that I think about it, uh, it's the bleeding obvious, of course, but I can't see how this doesn't help Trump in his right. primary fight and then in the general election should he win the primary which i for you know right now is uh the he's the odds on favorite just given the polling so yeah i in that sense it will um i suspect it will it could lead to a change that is a change of administration but the, the you know the the methods and tactics and strategy deployed to uh first try to prevent trump from winning the presidency and then to immediately undermine his presidency it illustrates to us the power and reach of the kind of establishment bipartisan, in many ways bipartisan establishment and the deep state or the administrative state, take your pick. So my question is, what are they going to do next time around? That is to say in 2024, because I'm of, I'm of our friend Mike Anton's opinion, which is they're not going to let him back in. Uh, that right. is Trump. So, so it, will this tune sort of normal Americans into this problem more acutely? I hope so. Or will it help prevent similar shenanigans? Uh, I hope so, but we'll see. So I well, think could, in that sense, independent voters being more independent voters and like honest Democrats being more open to, um, you know, unfair and nefarious treatment of Trump to prevent him from reascending to the presidency. I think that'll be maybe one other effect, which will be salutary. But who's, 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 the, who's going to hear about this? That's true. That's a good point. Yeah. I mean, there's a complete... Uh, I mean, the news media, you know, which frankly, I mean, OK, outside of Twitter and, you know, the Washington Examiner and, you know, uh, certain podcasts, where is this information like getting out? I mean, 90 percent of the electorate, I guarantee you, is not going to get deep into the, 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 the real meaning of the Durham report. Right. Well, the terror and, you know, apoplexy with which the audacity of like cnn hosting trump at a town hall the the kind of horror that that was greeted with <laughs> is like a perfect illustration of the principle that principle in reverse Seth. it's like just the the whole point is just like you you can't look at it because anytime you look at him anytime you're allowed to sort of hear what he actually says their whole sort of narrative mm -hmm. i mean there there is that phenomenon Ryan, the sort of like exploding cigar phenomenon of yeah. everything they try to do, everything they love. You know, every time they get there, wish their grubby little wish to like arrest him or put him in handcuffs or whatever. It always reflects worse on them than on him. Yeah. No matter what, like no matter how badly you think about him, even if you're not a Trump fan, inevitably his enemies like look worse. You know, the, the, if if you if you hated <sighs> Trump in extremis, it would still be the case that his enemies would be the only people that looked worse than him to you. Like if you really look at this thing head on, 
But the whole point is that, right, Seth, you know, you're never supposed to look at him head on. You're never supposed to hear what he has to say. Right after we recorded this podcast last week, CNN suddenly got into this hot water for just having a town hall featuring Donald right. Trump. And Trump was kind of on, from what I can tell. You know, he was at his Trumpian smug, smuggest, and he kind of got the crowd in the palm of his hand. And <laughs> so Alexander Ocasio-Cortez was like naturally taken to Twitter to chimp out about how this is like some sort of threat to our our very fabric of of civilization but it does sort of seem as if that is you know cnn made the the grievous mistake of considering itself a news outlet that like thinks of the front runner in one of the major parties as as newsworthy um which well, would they're go, stuck right 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 oh i'm sorry no no go on they, I, I think i mean there's yeah. They're, they're stuck because, I mean, the, the Trump years were like the golden years for CNN and, and MSNBC. I as mean, well as black small they businesses. Had so, and, they, I mean, they never had, a separate question. <laughs> <laughs> they never had to worry about, about what they were going to talk about. Uh, the advertising, you know, just poured in. They had record ratings. Right. Um, so they love Trump. They love Trump as content, but you know they prefer being able to just excerpt a few seconds here and there and amplifying it, giving him you know quote unquote air or oxygen mm -hmm. is is really what they got in trouble for. And what's funny is if he had gone on and been flustered, been put in his place, if people had laughed at him. If he'd said some outrageous stuff, then AOC would have praised CNN. <laughs> they would have been like, oh, this was such a great victory. Look how stupid he is. I mean, the only reason they're mad is because he did really well. And they know that in comparison, like Biden wouldn't be able to do any of that. Biden couldn't stand there for, for a minute and a half and take questions from the audience. Uh -huh. He just couldn't. I mean, Biden cannot handle taking questions that were given to specific reporters and he has the answer written down in front well, of now, him. Like, he can't do well, that. Now, hold on, Seth, Seth. I, I have a clip prepared that's going to make you eat your words. You, <laughs> you're you going to feel really silly when I play this clip from oh, okay. Biden's confrontation with reporters over the border after after Title 42 expired. We'll explain what this is about in a second, but let's just play the, the clip just so that Seth can be put to shame for his ageism over Biden. I think things are going at the border, sir. Much Type better than much, much better than you all expected. <laughs> Do you have any plans to visit no, the border? No, I think. Pardon me. Do you have any plans to visit the border? Not in the near term. No, no, just be disruptive, not anything else. And by the way, on the, when I went up to Bo's bench, you know, up at the other about four miles up, I uh, met two. Uh, Two people come up to me. There are a bunch of people. I, that's why I was a little late. I was taking a lot of pictures. But uh, uh, came up and said, "We went to St. Paul's in Scranton. We went <laughs> the same little grade school that I went to." And uh, so I was up there with Scranton people everywhere. Uh, Mr. President, yeah, it's just you a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Secretary Mayorkas said this morning that the numbers at the border have gone down since Title 42 was lifted. Are you confident that the numbers have peaked that they'll continue to go no, down look, they are they have gone down my hope is they'll continue to go down but we have more a lot more work to do and we need some more help from the congress as well in terms of funding and legislative changes anyway thank looking you looking forward to your trip on wednesday i am i, I hope it uh hope we're able to make it was it a nice mother's day it was <laughs> it just keeps going i forgot oh. how long it is it, tr donald trump is quaking in his boots don't you think having to face that kind of you were right thing. you were right um and it, it's nice that they had such hard-hitting follow-ups <laughs> as did you have a nice mother's day uh, right uh, well when they realized that he was struggling they just really wanted to press their advantage and you know drive <laughs> yeah drive the difficult issues home uh yeah no i mean this you, this is a really good point seth like the the real embarrassment is that if you put that next to 
Trump at town hall. He's like, I mean, he's whatever else you may say of him. He's a stand up comedian. Like he has this incredible way with the and he actually there were a few moments in the town hall that he like really got a good point across, like the famous Access Hollywood tape. He he made some good points about like I was describing the world. I wasn't actually advocating like, you know, raping women or whatever. <laughs> anyway, like he set the record straight on a lot of stuff and, and just kind of put them to shame because they've never actually heard from him. So they have no answers to prepare to respond to him. I'm just going to give the context of that clip real quick so that we can chat about that for a second. This is about the expiration of Title 42, which was one of these innumerable emergency pandemic era rules. But it has a kind of funny, like inverted twist, which is that this is one which actually <laughs> some Republicans were in favor of it, or at least were in favor of the outcome of it. Which, which is that it allowed border patrol agents to turn away migrants at the southern border on the grounds that they might bring COVID-19 into the U.S. My feeling is like, you know, if you want to turn them away on the grounds that they're wearing a funny hat, like what, just whatever, like, just just shut the border down. But that's that's basically what's happened now is this this provision has expired. A judge has ruled it can't continue. And I mean, I think it kind of remains to be seen. What if, it's an extremely volatile situation. What effect that's going to have on on the border crossings. But, you know, we can rest assured that Biden is on the case because he really, he really knows what's up. Yeah. The border is effectively open. That's from, from what normal people n normally interpreting the news can gather because they're, they're just paroling all of these migrants, giving them a later court date and then releasing them, sending them around the United States. Yeah. yeah. Court dates up to 2035. <laughs> and, you know, here's what I love about um, Title 42, and maybe I've mentioned this before. Okay, the whole time, like for the last year or whatever, there's been this whole thing, oh, Title 42, we need to, you know, if Title 42 is lifted, then there's going to be this huge rush at the border. Title 42, it's, it's kind of like, like a movie theater manager making up some rules and then saying that because of these rules, like we can't, it's like an internal rule. Like, right. what are they talking about? Are we a country or are we not a country? Right. Like the country is bound by like some COVID era regulation about the admission of non, of, of completely like non-legal aliens. It's, it's nonsense. I mean, it's the, the, the flimsiest excuse. And now, somehow or another, every newspaper is repeating the same thing. Oh, uh, in fact, uh, getting rid of Title 42 has, has lessened the number of people crossing the border, which makes absolutely no sense. Um, I mean, I know New York City is overrun at this point. I mean, they're starting to put people in high school gyms. Uh, they were going to do that. At the last minute, they, they, they've scrapped the idea because it was such a disaster. They, they're taking over every hotel, essentially, to the point where regular tourists and visitors are not going to be able to get hotel rooms. Hmm. It's, it's, I mean, I gather this is happening all over the country. And we're talking about six to 10 million people right, from all over the world. And these are not like people fleeing persecution, no. which is the only basis for asylum. No, they're just economic migrants. Right. It is uh, preposterous in the extreme that you have to, like, invent pandemic threat to just turn people away at the border who aren't citizens or to have control over your borders. That's like there's something to me. I, I shouldn't laugh about it because it's such a, like, appalling abuse of the American people and of justice. But there is something to me just it's kind of pitiful about having to, like, seize on this quite illegitimate pretext it's like a, it's like two illegitimacies make a, a right or something that by the time you get around to wielding these covid powers like then maybe you can use that as a reason it's like also sort of which sacred precept like trumps the other like open borders and the sanctity of non-white people is like one sacred precept but also covid is another so like to which to which do we huh. appeal anyway um, yeah. Any I'm, any yeah. serious candidate for the presidency need, on that's sane yeah. on the right needs to be thinking how you're going to talk about and execute mass deportations uh, in the coming years because if you don't, uh, America will be 
fundamentally and probably irreparably transformed and our standard of living will continue to plummet and it's it's just a disaster hmm. okay well with that directive to any potential presidential candidates that, that may be listening no i think that's that's pretty serious and we're running a feature by the way this i mean this segue neatly into telling people to read the damn site which is our last little moment here to just invite you to check out americanmind.org we are currently running a feature series of pieces about what republican candidates need to be serious about have on their minds um, i'm going to commend to you an old piece which is then now being kind of resurfaced because we've added to the feature uh, that it introduced. And and that is uh, Ryan's essay, which introduces the feature called What Next? And What Must Be Done is the head header of this piece, I believe. Yeah. And this is Ryan's sort of summation of the state of affairs, but also his kind of laundry list of uh, things that people need to be serious about if, if they want to, A, win the support of you know, the kind of broad and emerging coalition, populist coalition on the right, but also be, you know, actually do the job that any Republican president would be elected to do, namely restore some sanity in order to our politics. So it's called What Next? And I invite you to check out the whole feature, which it introduces. Ryan, why don't you go next? What do you got? Yeah, I'll just tell people too that that feature is a kind of a mega feature because it features <laughs> features mm -hmm. some features pieces, features, some yeah. pieces from January, including mine, and then a, a bunch of updated stuff uh, on uh, the sort of Ron Don fight, among other things. Um, uh, you guys, you recommended last week, Spencer, Dan McCarthy's piece on how Trump could certainly win again, That's which right. is uh, one of the many good pieces. Uh, I'm going to recommend something slightly off the beaten path, not because the contributor is uh, off the beaten path. He's a uh, regular these days. Raw egg nationalist, the rules of the gamete about declining fertility, a topic that he has thought a lot about and writes a lot about. And it's it's off the beaten path in the sense that, you know, he takes you on a kind of cook's tour of the ancient world trying to deal with the problem of fertility, whether it be ancient Greece or Sparta or the Scythians or the Comanche. So not quite the ancient world, but a, a sort of bridge between uh, the old world and the new, the Comanche in America, and how uh, how these different cultures regarded fertility, their sort of cosmology of fertility, and and then brings it home to try to talk through what we ought to be doing about the decline in fertility and decline in sperm, actually, which is a huge problem across the the modern world because of various endocrine disruptors and all the chemicals we have. He mentions fire retardants and plastics and all that sort of stuff. So. It's not unprecedented to have a fertility problem, but ours is a serious one and seems to be on track to be very bad unless we do something about it. So it's, a, it's an interesting issue and one that touches on civilizational survival and, and human flourishing and is a, it's just a fun read. Yeah, that one's great. It's yeah, Ren, Ren was really showing off his, um, his yeah. he was really showing off his broad register of, uh, of knowledge in that one. That was, that was, uh. That was a tour de force, I thought. Uh, yeah, I, I was not. Um, I was not familiar with uh, with uh, what is it? It's it's pseudo Hippocrates. Is that right, Spencer? Uh, and, on airs and places. Yes, yeah, pseudo Hippocrates and, on airs and places. And and, uh, and his uh, discussion of the causes of Scythian infertility, including riding too many horses and and being too feminine. It's and pretty funny. Being being fat, right? Yeah, <laughs> and being exactly. fat. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, it's great. It's the it's a, a really fun piece. Seth, um, for my got? piece, someone who writes for us rather frequently, uh, August August uh, Mayrot. Mm -hmm. He is a uh, English teacher for secondary students in uh, Dallas, around Dallas somewhere. And he writes for us pretty frequently, but I, I really like this piece. He wrote Cell Block about the challenges that Zoomers have been facing in the workplace. And, you know, they're very... Um, Maybe they're a little selfish. They're a little self-absorbed. They, they don't necessarily. They, they, they're having trouble acclimating themselves to the demands of regular employment. But he's kind. You know, having taught this generation, he's he's sympathetic to them and points out that in many ways they've been victims of their own the bad, the bad child rearing practices of their parents, and also you know they've been flooded by technology and you know the the addiction to their devices you can't really blame them so he, he kind of gives a nice talk about how maybe we need to be gentle with them and they can uh, 
overcome some of the uh, difficulties that they face. It's a good piece, Cell Block. Yep, and excellent title. Did you come up with that title, Seth? Or is that your uh, I did. innovation? Can we say? Okay, yeah. It's, I think it's, it's an open secret that, that we picked the titles, and <laughs> that was a really good one. <laughs> not, to, not to embarrass you. Great, okay. Well, with that, we are going to bid you adieu, fair listener. Thank you very much for listening. It's a pleasure always to be here with you. Um, you should check out our various websites. We have already commended one to you highly, and that's AmericanMind.org. But we have a lot of other stuff going on. You can go to Claremont.org and check out the Institute itself. You can go to ClaremontReviewOfBooks.com to check out our big sister publication, the Claremont Review of Books. And you can go visit our the website for our D.C.-based Center for the American Way of Life, dc.claremont.org. Finally, if you would like to contribute to this project of ours to help support us, you can go to claremont.org slash donate and mention in the notes if you like that you appreciate the roundtable. We always like to hear about that. And we'll shout you out, too, if, if you like. Or you can remain anonymous. Finally, finally, do not forget to rate, review, share, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Apple Podcasts is a great place to give us five stars. Spotify is a great place to give us five stars. And the whole world is a great place to keep your negative opinions to yourself if you have them. Just, just you know, <laughs> it's a good time to, to keep silent. Um, but we really do, uh, we benefit a lot when you share, when you let people know about the show. That's how we grow the audience. And we would appreciate if you would do that. Thanks to our production crew, Logan Zapieri and Jake Gannon. And thanks to you all for listening. Talk to you next week. Bye.